All right, so morning all. Uh, this is the last of our series of lectures on recurrent networks. Now, uh, being that this is the day after the uh, U.S. presidential election, I didn't I, I didn't actually make any polls for today's lecture because I was too busy watching the election. And also, I want to get through this topic today. I want to wrap up our recurrent networks today, so I will probably go through faster than normal and uh, we won't pause. So uh, here's the problem that we, uh, be we began with. This is the sequence to sequence modeling problem. We are continuing our discussion on sequence to sequence modeling. So the problem is generally this, some sequence x1 through xn goes in, a different sequence y1 through yn comes out, like in speech recognition, speech, speech frames or speech vectors go in, text comes out, machine translation. Some sequence of words in English goes in, something in French comes out, or dialogue. Uh, the user's question goes in, the system's response comes out. Question answering, you know, the user's question goes in and answer comes out. So all of these are sequence to sequence translation systems. And the number of symbols coming out doesn't have to be the same as the number of symbols, number, the same as the number of symbols going in. And uh, we saw two different cases of this problem. And in the first, uh, we had order synchrony. So or, although the number of symbols are different, the order of the symbols and the output sort of follows the order of the input. So for example, here, the portion of the input corresponding to the word I is going to come before the portion of the input corresponding to the word eight, and that comes before the portion of the input for N and so on. So this order correspondence between the input and the output. That's for speech recognition. For machine translation, you don't even have that order correspondence. For example, if you were translating English to German, I ate an apple is going to become ich habe einen Apfel gegessen. So I became ish, but eight split into habe and gegessen. So you can see that the order there is the uh, order of the symbols in the output doesn't match the order in the input, and in fact. It's, it can be a one-to-many correspondence between the input and the output or a many-to-one. So there's no strict relationship between the manner in which things come in and the manner in which things go out. Now, we've seen the first case over the past several lectures where the input and output are order aligned, but not time aligned. Today, we're gonna to look at the second case where there is no no notion of any kind of order correspondence between the input and the output. So before this, we'll start off by recall, uh, recalling a related problem, predicting text. We've seen this before. Here we are given a sequence of symbols, characters of words, W1 through Wn. We must predict the next symbol in the sequence, which is Wn plus one. Now, this was basically the language modeling problem learning the sequential structure of language so that you're given a sequence of words like four score and seven years, you're able to predict that the next word is a go. Or given the sequence of characters, you're able to predict that the next character must be the character N. And we saw, oh, my uh, PowerPoint has always likes to freeze. But anyway, while my PowerPoint decides to move, we saw that we can model the whole thing with a recurrent network where uh, the uh, model takes in the sequence of symbols and always outputs the next symbol in the sequence. So it would take in, for instance, W0 and then output W1, then takes in W0 and W1 and outputs W2 and so on. And of course, we saw that because these are symbols, and networks like to work with numbers. We represent our symbols as one hot vectors. We project these one hot vectors down to a lower dimension before we operate on them. This simple network that I've shown over here is typically going to have these several layers of units like LSTMs. The output is typically a softmax, which computes a probability distribution over the words. And uh, so when we wanted to train the network, again, this is all a recap of what we've already seen. The, if, if you're training a network to predict the next word, then the target output at each time is the next word in the sequence. 
And so the divergence we computed because you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between each output and the desired output. We summed the divergences at individual times. And at each time, the divergence was the divergence between the output probability distribution of the network and the one hot representation of the word itself. This divergence is what we minimize to train the network. And here's the important part for us. Once we've trained the network, we saw we could use it to generate language from the model. What we could do is to give it an initial sequence of words. Typically, again, they're presented as one hot vectors, which are projected down. After the last word has been input out here, the network is going to output a probability distribution at this point. To generate this, this text, we are going to sample one word from this probability distribution somehow. And as you, all of you know, how to draw a sample from a category distribution. If not, you should read up about it. So this is going to be our prediction for the next word from W4. And then we input W4 to the network as the next word. And it's going to output a distribution here. And we sample a probably this we sample the next word from this distribution. And then we output, we input that uh, word again and the network will produce a new probability distribution of the next time we, we draw the next word from that one and keep doing this. We can keep on generating text. So when do we stop? When does this generation stop and how do we decide that the output is complete? Now, this is just a random process. So, uh, you know, in theory, you can just input three words and this could continue generating symbols for the, for the rest of time. Whereas in reality, uh, we never speak for infinite time. These things must end. And just looking at the sequence of words, uh, sequence of outputs, you can't really say that this is where it must end. So consider something like this. A sequence of words by itself does not really indicate if it's a complete sentence or not. For example, if you saw the sequence of words, four score and eight. Now, just looking at the sequence of words, you can't state if this was the beginning of a sentence which began with the word four, or if it's end of a sentence which ended with the word eight, or if it's at the middle of a sentence where you have words before and after. So uh, in order to sort of disambiguate the position of the sequence of words, we will need explicit symbols to mark the beginnings and ends of sentences. So in order to be able to uh, identify the beginnings and ends of sentences, we are now going to add two additional symbols to our vocabulary. The first is the symbol SOS, which indicates start of sentence. The second is the symbol EOS, which indicates end of a sentence. And to see how these symbols are actually used, let's see some examples. So this is four score and eight. This is just a sequence of words. It has no beginning sentence or end sentence marker. So this is in the middle of a sentence. But then if I want to say this is sequence of words is at the beginning of a sentence, I'm going to say SOS start of some sentence marker followed by four score and eight. So this clearly indicates that this is the beginning of a sentence. Now, suppose uh, I gave you this one instant, four score and eight and EOS marker then this is clearly the end of a sentence because after the sentence ends right here, the next symbol is the end of sentence marker. Whereas if I take a look at this one, beginning of sentence marker, four score and eight end of sentence marker, this means that the sentence began with the word four, it ended with the word eight. So this is a full sentence. So uh, does everybody get the distinction between the, the uh, just a sequence of the, the begin sentence marker and the end sentence marker and how they are used? Raise your hands if you got the distinction. Okay, so let me just give you this, right? Suppose I say, hello kitty. 
using our notation. Is this the beginning of a sentence or the end of a sentence? Can anyone tell me? Anyone? It's impossible. Unless you Pardon? had like, yeah, you wouldn't be able to tell unless you had like a capital H or a period at the end. Even then you couldn't. This is using our notation, it's a mid sentence, right? Suppose I did this, SOS, Hello Kitty. Is this the beginning of a sentence or the end of a sentence? Beginning. This is clear. Yeah, this, okay. What about this? Hello Kitty, end of sentence. What is this? End of the sentence. And what about this guy? Hello Kitty. The what is this? Sentence. This is a full sentence. So you see the distinction over here. If I do not have the markers, this is in the middle of a sentence, right? So uh, we will take a shortcut sometimes. We, we won't actually use two different symbols. In fact, we might just have some dot hello kitty. And if the dot appears before the first word, it's the beginning of a sentence marker. If it appears after the last word, it's the end of sentence marker. The point is that we need this tag to identify the beginnings and ends of sentences. And so over here, when we want to generate a sentence, all we will do is continue this, this end of sentence marker is going to be part of your vocabulary. And you're going to continue generating sentences and words until at some point you generate, generate an end of sentence marker. And at that point is when you will stop. So uh, is this clear to everybody? This is how the generation would, uh, when the generation stops, and uh, how this relates to, to the end of sentence marker. Everybody get that? Raise your hands if it does, if you do. Most of you, anyway, okay. So now returning to our problem, right? Here is the problem, sequence to sequence model, where you don't have any kind of synchrony between the input and the output. So for this model, the kind of network that we will use is going to be a network of this structure. This is the delayed sequence to sequence model. This model has two distinct components. This first component is this guy here, which processes the input. And at the end of the input, when the last symbol in the input goes in, it generates a hidden representation for it out here. And so I could write pseudocode for it. This is just a standard recurrent neural network. Uh, it goes through time, input time, it reads the inputs and generates a hidden state. And so this one here is the hidden state generated when the final symbol and the input has been processed. Once we compute the hidden representation, we can use it to generate the output using the same procedure that we used for generating language. So this is the same as generating language. That's why you know, it was important to see how language generation worked. Here's the pseudocode. Once you've generated this hidden representation, then I can proceed through the, uh, in a loop. At each time, we first run a record, an RNN step that uses the current hidden representation to compute the next recurrent hidden representation. And also the output probability distribution. Yes, were there some questions? Anyone? No, right? And then the next word is drawn from the output probability distribution. And you continue doing this till you generate an end of sequence or end of sentence marker. So this is the important bit over here. This was the recurrent network, right? What is this portion of the code doing? This portion of the code is doing something like this. You have your hidden representation, which came from the input. And then you are at each time, you're generating a hidden representation. And also you're putting this through an output layer, which generates a probability distribution. And from this probability distribution, you're randomly selecting an output. So, this, so in the pseudocode out here, you have the two steps. The RNN output step is the process of reading this input. There's no other input, right? It's only the hidden state. And 
generating this guy out here and then generating this output distribution as well. And then the draw word from it, step, is the one that actually selects a word from this distribution. So is that clear to everyone? Raise your hands if it is. Okay, good enough. At least half of you, right? If you guys aren't raising your hands today, I'm not going to force you too much. This, this today's lecture figures heavily in homework four. If you don't understand today's lecture, you're in trouble in homework four. So you please pay attention. Now, uh, so here is a problem. What is the problem with a structure of this kind? What is the problem if I generate uh, words in this manner? Can anybody tell me? What is the problem if I generate words in this manner? What can you tell me vis-a-vis -vis the output that is generated? Suppose I generate the word A out here. Does that, in, if this generation is the process of randomly selecting something from this distribution, correct? So suppose I randomly select the word A out here, will that in any way affect what is being computed here? Yes or no? Guys? Yes? Who says yes? I do. Okay. Why do you think it does? I mean, given the current setup, it it should is what I'm getting at. But does it? No. Okay. So that means regardless of whether I chose the word A here or the, whether I chose the word and here, the probability of dark is going to stay the same on both sides, in both cases, right? And whereas A dark makes sense, but AM dark makes no sense. This doesn't make any sense. So how do I fix this? Suggestions? How would I fix this? Can you add a link from the previous block to the current block, maybe? Block, so which block? There, are, there already is a link over here from oh. the record, right? Mm. So what you really want to do is to let that network over here know that you chose the word A, correct? Yes. If you yeah, didn't, yeah. That, yeah. that way, it will know that it can give a high probability to a dark, but it should not give you a high probability to the word apple, right? Because the input, because the word that, has, that was generated here was the word A. Is that making sense to everybody? So we're not Crazy. just arg max at the, at the A step? Regardless of whether, how I selected it is immaterial, right? The point is that if I got an A, because right now in the basic structure, the only info, this final act of selection from here is not influencing this computation. But like, like if it's selecting a high probability of A, for example, then you know the hidden state at that thing which is fed into the next one should like. Suppose I have something like this, right? Where A and N are almost the same probability. Or this, even say the same probability. There's nothing stopping this from happening, there, is there? I guess, yeah, not. Right, so, so in order for this to actually make sense, this structure, so you can see this. And so. You can see this in the recurrent uh, uh, pseudocode. This Y is not figuring in the recurrent step. So what we will do is to sort of split this model here and say that the final output that has been drawn is going to go back into the input. And so this is how we're, this is our final simple translation model. So uh, I'm going to use language translation as an example in all of these cases. So it has two parts. The first part is this recurrent structure over here. Uh, we feed it an input sequence. The input sequence must have a definite termination, an end of sentence marker. And the hidden activation at the final output is assumed to carry all the information about this input. That hidden activation is then uh, fed to the second RNN and the second RNN is going to take this hidden activation and at the, for the first very first word, it's going to assume that the first word is a start of symbol marker. 
and then using the startup symbol marker and the hidden activation is then going to go through the next recurrence where there's a recurrence over the hidden state, but also the word that was drawn goes back in. And this process is continued until an end of sentence mark, uh, marker has been uh, generated. So for here, for example, after you have processed the input, you would get this hidden state. Then at the first time for the output, this gets passed to the second, the, the second component of the network. And a startup symbol sentence marker goes in. It's going to generate a distribution from which maybe you draw the word ish. Then now this ish goes in, this goes in as well. It produces a distribution, you draw the next word. And you keep doing this until it generates an end of sentence marker on the output side. So, uh, uh, Everybody, does everybody get what happened over here? This process, raise your hands. Good enough, at least 40 of you. Now observe what happens here. If I had drawn a different word over here, instead of Asia, I had drawn the word do, which is you in German, that would have gone in and so the probability distribution produced here would have been very different. And ideally that distribution would have been more suited to the word do than to the word ish, so that the whole structure still holds together, right? So uh, there's this feedback of the actual word drawn that influences the future. Now, again, just a warning, I'm using this little representation in my figures that I'm assuming that the figure seems to indicate there's just one hidden layer, not the case. You can have any number of hidden layers. I'm just, so uh, this little box hides a lot of dark magic, okay? So here is the modified pseudocode. Now the recurrent network output not only takes in the previous hidden state, but it also takes in the word that was selected in the previous time. So that's the only change that happened to the code. And so now if I drew a different word at time t, then at the next time, this word goes back into my recurrent output step. And so that's going to change the output. And so this is our uh, simple translation model. I can sort of separate it into two parts. The first part is the part that processes the input and generates the certain representation. I'm going to call that the encoder. The second part is the part that operates on the sudden representation after representation and generates the output. I'm going to call this part the decoder. So uh, this let's take this take a take a look at this process again. First, the inputs are going to be represented not as words but as one hot vectors, and so uh, and which are going, which are mapped into lower dimensional embeddings because that's the only way you can actually represent symbols. Now, now these embeddings may be learned along with the rest of the network or they could be learned separately. Now, one thing to note is that if I'm translating say English to German, the vocabulary on this side is going to be very different from the vocabulary on this side. So these embedding matrices out here on the encoder side can be very different or will be very different from the encoder matrices on the output side in the general case. Now, uh, also we have said so far that the output of the decoder at any time is a probability distribution over the symbols. I'm going to assume that the uh, symbols are words to explain. Now, what exactly is this distribution in terms of math? So this distribution is the probability of the words at the probability distribution over the first word in the output, given the entire input and the fact that it is, it is the first word. So this probability distribution is the probability of O1, given that the, it is the first word and the entire input. That's what you're going to be drawing something from. And so you draw something from that and you feed it back in. At this point, the second probability distribution is the probability distribution for the second word given the entire input 
and that the first word was the word ish. So you might draw something from here. You've chosen it. And when you feed back that thing over here, the probability distribution at this point, that is the probability, the probability of the third distribution for the third word in the output sentence, given the entire input and the first two words in the output. So do you see how these guys, does all of you, do all of you get what this probability distribution is? How at each time, the output probability distribution is conditioned not only on the input, but also all the words output at previous times. So do you get this? Raise your hands. And if you don't get it, ask me a question because this is going to, this is going to figure pretty prominently. Questions? Anything on chat? Question. Yeah, no, no questions. All right. Could after so, translation be SOS? Pardon me? Uh, there's a question on chat. Uh, shouldn't the first output after translation be SOS? No, SOS is the start of sentence marker. Start of sentence marker is what you're telling it to indicate that the sentence has begun. So this is, you, 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 you have to input an initial word. See this, these columns are all identical. So if this column is identical, what is the input you're going to give at the first time when there is no sentence yet, when there's no previous word yet? So this SOS is what triggers the production of words. You need something here, right? That is going to be the SOS. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does answer the okay. question. All right, so, and so you can continue this till the end of sentence marker has been produced, right? Now, so the overall process is this. At each time, the network produces a probability distribution over the words given the entire input and all the words until that time. Uh, and then at each time a word is drawn from this output distribution and that word is provide, provided as input at the next time. And this process continues till an end of sentence marker is produced. Now, through all of this, I've sort of used this magic term, draw a word from the distribution. What exactly is this process of drawing a word from this distribution? So if I asked you, what do I mean by this? Uh, can any of you tell me what your interpretation of this magical draw word would be out here? What do you think this is? Anyone? So how many of you are familiar with the, uh, with the problem of drawing a, a, an output from a distribution, from say uh, a category distribution, like the roll of a die? How, would you know how to simulate rolling dice? Raise your hands if you would. So Ronit, maybe you can answer me. How, how would you simulate rolling dice? Randomly. So what, so what do you mean by randomly? What is the process there? If you were coding it. Uh, if it's, you take a random number from zero to one, if it's greater than 0 0.5, it's heads. If exactly, it's that's exactly it, right? Now suppose out here, so what would the same process mean? You just do it with different, um, different ranges. So you do different ranges, one for each word. That's about it, right? So yeah. that so this could be a random draw, but you could also be selecting the most probable word. I mean, I've sort of hidden everything in this magic term, right? So now, so the probability uh, of the complete out output sequence given all of this, which is the probability of this entire sequence of words is, given the entire sequence of inputs can be thought of in this manner. I can think of as, so this entire machine machine can be thought of as something that takes in this input and produces this output, right? So what is the probability of generating this sequence of outputs given this sequence of inputs? That's what's the probability of O1 through OL given I1 through IN. Using Bayes rule, 
I can decompose this. Is the probability of O1 given the input times the probability of O2 given the input and O1 times the probability of O3 given the input O1 and O2 and so on all the way until the end. And O1, so the probability of O1 given the input is simply the probability assigned to this word O1 by the network at time one. The probability of O2 given the input and the first word is simply the probability assigned to O2 by the network at time two when O1 is also fed in as the word. Similarly, the prob probability of O3 given the input and the first two words is the probability assigned to O3 by the network given that O1 and O2 were also fed in at the previous times. So the probability of the entire output sequence given the entire input sequence just ends up being the product of the probabilities assigned to the individual words in the sequence by the network. So is this making sense to you? Raise your hands. Good enough, right? This is easy. And so what do I as a machine translation person want to do? Given an input, I want to, in English, I want to pull out the most probable sequence of German words. So our objective of drawing is to produce the most likely output given the input, input sequence. So in other words, I want to produce, choose the output sequence of words such that the probability of the output sequence of words, which is the product of the probabilities assigned to the words is maximum. Now, what do you see as the problem over here? There's some, this causes a challenge. What do you think the challenge might be? Anybody want to take a guess, raise a hand or just say something. So what could be the issue with this? Like it doesn't really end with EOS. Yeah, Chien, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily end with EOS. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm speaking of any, even if I say I'm, I'm, find me the most probable sequence that ends with EOS. Computationally, how much, how, how much, how expensive is it? This is too big. Yeah, this is very big to set on. This is going, this is going to be exponential in size. Why, right? So let's see how we can actually select this most likely word, this most likely sequence. Yeah, yeah. I could do this greedily, right? I could just pick the, uh, I want to pick the sequence of symbols such that the probability, product of probabilities is highest. Now a cheap solution is say, I'm going to pick the most probable word at the first, at the first time, feed that back in. Then I'm going to choose the most probable word at the second time, feed that back in and so on. So over here, I could just, this draw could just be selecting the most likely output at each, at each time. Do you think that's, that is going to give me overall the most likely sequence of words? If I simply draw the most likely word at each time, will it necessarily give me the most likely sequence of words? Yes, no. Anyone? Not guaranteed. It is not guaranteed, right? And so the reason for it is this, right? You can't just pick the most likely sequence symbol because this can get that cause the distribution to become more confused at the next time. And choosing a different, less likely word at this time could cause the distribution at the next time to be more peaky, resulting in a more likely overall output. Now, if that's, that sounds like a lot of English and it isn't making sense, let's take a look at an example, right? This is a hypothetical. Let's say I'm doing some speech recognition in English. I got a sequence of words and or some translation in English. I got a, and, and I got a sequence of words. At the first time, let's say I got a bunch of probability distribution and let's say I chose the word he, right? And so now at the next time, let's just say I got this probability distribution and I got these two words, nose with the N and nose with the K. And both of them have almost the same probability, right? 
So maybe this is like 0.2 and this is like 0.199, right? They have almost the same probability. If you chose the most likely word, you're going to choose nose, right? Nose with the N. And so now the first word is he, the second word was nose, but he knows what kind of a sentence is that? It's, it's kind of, it's structurally kind of broken, right? So if I asked you, you know, what is the next word for the sentence he knows, can anybody even suggest something reasonable that would fit for the third word? Anyone? Can you suggest something? Or do you think it's just too corny? What do you think guys? Somebody say something. Okay, let me pick a random person out here and ask you if this made sense. So Mitch, can it, you suggest something? Sense. Pardon me? You, you could say, uh, oh yeah, someone put on chat, he knows dived. That's a good one actually. Yeah, but it's kind of corny, right? It's, it's, there's really no clear word out here. So although nose was the higher probability word, even the network is going to be just as conf confused as you guys. So maybe it assigns low probabilities to all the words, right? Whereas if I had chosen knows with the K, then you can think of several words which perfectly fit over here, like he knows something, right? And so what would happen was that although you chose the lower probability word for the second word, when you got to the third word, you got some words that just stuck out in terms of probabilities. And so when you multiply the probabilities of the first three words, although the second word here was more probable, by the time you're getting done with all three words, this sequence is going to have the overall higher probability than this one. So does that make sense? Yes, no, raise your hands if it made sense. Okay, makes sense, right? So the problem is when I'm looking, generating the second word, I don't know what the third word is going to be. So I don't know that I have to choose knows, knows and not knows. And, uh, so there's really no way for us to know whether the nose with the N or the nose with the K is going to give you a cleaner distribution down, down the line. And in fact, it might not be the next word. It could be several words down the line. For example, over here, the first word. Suppose in the first, in the very first word, you had a choice of, you know, he, which was high, and the, which was just slightly less high, right? right? And now, when you chose he in the first word, he, then, then uh, he knows, ends up breaking things, and you're forced to generate he knows something. Whereas the knows might well have given you something that had even higher probability at the third place, given your input. And so, if you had chosen the in the first position instead of he, at the end of three words, you might have gotten the most likely output of, of all. So the problem really is that the, the, the decisions you make might end up influencing choices so far down the line that you cannot even predict it. And so uh, you might just end up walking into a suboptimal hole just because you chose the wrong word. So here's the problem. A bad choice at any time can end up causing things to go bad downstream and we don't know what to choose at any time, right? No, so there's one simple solution. You can just punt on it, say, I know I have no way of figuring out whether what I'm doing right now is good or not. So why don't I just randomly draw a word according to the output distribution and just live with it? And just like we did for uh, language generation. So basically over here, this drawing is just going to be a random sampling from this probability distribution. Right, so uh, it turns out, oddly enough, that uh, uh, random sampling, firstly, random sampling is almost certainly not going to give you the optimal overall decode. Although it turns out that 
randomly sampling words will often give you a more likely overall decode than if you just greedily chose the most likely word at each time. It kind of sounds paradoxical, but random selection from these distributions can end up giving you a sequence of O's where the product of their corresponding Y's could be higher than if you just chose the most likely word at each time, simply because the word you choose at each time influences what happens downstream. But let's go back to the problem. The problem arises from the fact that making a choice at any time can result in poor future outputs. And the real issue is that when you made the choice, you have no way of knowing that this is going to influence things downstream. Here, for example, we couldn't know that choosing he is going to cause confusions two words later that cause, that cause the entire uh, uh, sequence of outputs to break down, right? So the solution, let's not choose. Let's keep them all and select the most likely one at the end. So here at time one, instead of selecting the one most likely word or any single word from this output distribution, I'm going to fork the network. I'm going to make as many copies of the decoder as I have words in my vocabulary. And then I'm going to pass a different word to each one of these instances in the vocabulary, right? Each one of these instances of the decoder. And then I get hidden representations. These guys, again, I'm going to fork out. I'm going to make as many copies of the decoder following each one of these guys as the number of words I have in my vocabulary. And each of these in turn is going to get an, a different word from the vocabulary. So by this time, by the time I get here, I'm considering every possible two word sequence that I could have generated. And if I decide to stop after only two words, then I can sort of go down this list and pick the sequence for which the product of these two probabilities is highest. Is that making sense to you guys? Okay. So somebody's saying something, but I only heard a buzz. So is this making sense to you guys? Raise your hands if it does. Right, so what is the probability pro problem with doing something of this kind? Anyone? It's going to blow up, right? Uh, and what is the second problem? The second problem is to know how to, when to end, because you can keep continuing, right? Some branches will end and the others will not. So uh, the uh, let's handle the first problem. So here's one. The first problem that it gets too large, we're going to do this by pruning. At each time, you expand it out, but then you just keep only the top K most probable forks, scoring forks. So which means so to say that uh, you'd go through these words and just choose the top K according to the word that you are actually going to output because that's all you have at this time, right? And you're going to just expand out only the top K words. And then from here, you'd expand things out on. And now, again, once again, you're going to just choose the top K, but when you choose the top K, you're not going to just choose the top K based on the probability of the latest word. It's going to be the prop based on the pro product, prob product of the probabilities of all the words along the path. So for this path, you're going to be choosing it based on the product of the probability of he, I, for this it's he knows, for this it's he, whatever else, for this is gonna be the I, the knows, the whatever else. So because you're always interested in the entire sequence and then you choose the top K for which the path, the path probability was highest and only retain those and then expand that again and, and then retain the top K and keep doing this. Going down the line, at each time, you're going to be pruning based on the product of the probabilities in, over the entire path. So is this making sense to you guys? Raise your hands if it did. This is kind of like beam search? This is exactly beam search. This is exactly beam search, right? So then you have one issue then. The issue is, when will we end? So we are going to continue to generate words 
until so observe that at each time you're always also generating an end of sequence marker why is that at each time you're always generating several end of sentence markers why is that marker is in the vocabulary because you're considering the entire vocabulary right yeah. so does that mean you can you're just going to terminate the sentence no if pruning kills the end of sentence marker a you don't even need to uh, you don't need to consider it at all right so what you will do is you will keep doing this until the most likely sequence terminates with an end of sentence marker. And that's when we're going to actually generate it, terminate the output. So uh, in the process, of course, anytime you have uh, uh, a path, partial path that has ended in an end of sentence marker, this one is not going to be expanded. You're only going to be expanding the parts that end in the remaining words in the vocabulary, because an end of sentence marker says the sentence has ended. And then you would continue this until you got to a partial path where the uh, end of sentence marker, the, the path including the end of sentence marker was the high, had the highest probability. And that is going to be your output. And of course, if you know how to do this, then you can continue to do this to generate the top n most likely outputs rather than just the top one output. So is this making sense to everybody so far? Yes, and this is because the following the following uh, sequences must be smaller probabilities because it, they're between zero and one, so the decay- because, Exactly, because if you okay. extend it, it's got the probabilities, it's got to go down. It's not gonna increase, right? Yeah. Right, perfect. So everybody gets this. There's some pseudocode over here. I'm not gonna go over the pseudocode, right? So we figured out how to, Build such a system, we've seen how to perform the decoding on the system. But then now we have this other issue, how do you train the system? So we've got the inference down pat, how do we train it? So we have to train it to make the right predictions. So the English to German translator must be able to take I ate an apple and correctly output Ishaba in an Apfel gegessen. So how do we teach the network to do this? Now our training data is going to consist of input and output target sequences. So uh, this is going to be, you know, I ate an apple, end of sentence marker should become, you know, ish have an apple gigas and end of sentence marker, right? So as always, we're going to train, we are going to sort of initialize our, our network randomly and we're going to use gradient descent to train our model. But then the real problem is computing the gradients. And for that, we need backdrop and the issues, how do we do backdrop? Now think of it this way. Uh, so ideally here is the situation. I have the, the, the sequence to sequence translator. I have my input going in, A, I, A, and Apple, right? If I think of the whole thing as a black, as, as a black box, I have, some output coming out and my target output is ish habe einen apfel gegessen and end of sentence marker, right? So what would the problem be in training this network? I have to compute this divergence, right? And I've got to back propagate, back propagate the derivative of the divergence into the network to train the parameters out here. So when you look at this, what is the first problem that you're going to, that you see directly? Something's got to just stand out at you. What is that? Anyone? Okay, let me give you a hint. This output, how many words does it have in my example? So oh, they have different lengths. They can have, you have no control over what comes out over here, right? It can be one word, seven words, 87 words. You have no control over what goes out over here, right? Yeah. Right? So the forward pass is going to break down the inference. The inference in the forward pass is going to give you something that's so, almost certainly going to give you something that's so horrible that it's not comparable with this guy at all. So how can you solve for this? Any suggestion? How do you fix the problem? 
um, would it make sense to have like um, some output uh, in that output from the first four words that feed into divergence? So, so here is what here, sir. So I think I think this is what you're getting at. So here's what we will actually do in the decoding. Remember, the decoding keeps pulling the output from here and feeding it back in. Instead of doing that, in the decoder side, we will actually feed in the ground truth. So do you see what's happening here? Do you see how this is different from your standard neural network training? Yeah, yeah. The but output it, is not going to feed back in the inputs. The correct output. So in the standard neural network training, you just take this input, you'd read this output, you'd compute the divergence. But now, when we perform the forward pass, we are actually using the output itself over here, and that way you ensure that the number of symbols output correctly matches the length of the output, and now you can compute the divergence, right? So even during the forward pass, we need both the input and the output, the target output. And now we can compute the divergence word by word and back propagate the whole thing and train your network. So this clear to everybody? Raise your hands, yes, if it is. Yes. Okay, I'll wait for 40 hands to be raised. All right, perfect. So. In practice, what we you know you would be doing something like SGD. So what you would do is instead of computing the divergence everywhere, uh, there are various tricks of the trade. One of which is to just randomly choose just one of the words out here, and propagate its divergence backwards, and various other tricks. So uh, uh, the uh, so overall in each iteration, you're going to randomly select a training instance, which is the input sequence and the output sequence, forward pass then randomly select just one time instant in the output and just propagate this divergence backwards through the network to update your parameters. And so here is the overall training process. You're given several training instances. For each training instance, compute the output of the network. Observe that both the input and the target output are used in the forward pass. In the backward pass, you compute the divergence between some one or more randomly chosen words from the output and propagate the divergence backwards and update parameters. So, so this randomness seems to really help. Uh, let's look at some applications. Now, we're gonna go past this, but let's look at some typical applications of a sequence to sequence model of this kind, machine translation. Like, you know, my name is Tom, goes in, ish, hi, ze, Tom, or my, my name is Tom, these, this, these, these can come up. Or speech recognition, you have a speech recording going in, my name is Tom, comes out. A dialogue system, I have a problem goes in, how may I help you, comes out. So see that there's no relation between this guy and this guy, it's all latent, right? Or you can even have image to text, a picture goes in, a caption for the picture comes out because this only changes the encoder of the network, the decoder does not change. So uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, in the original paper by, by Satskever, uh, at all, where they published this work, they uh, showed that the encoder actually, that's trained properly, actually ends up learning some very nice representations. So this is the representation over here that has been derived for the entire input by the encoder. What does it look like? Here are some examples. So this is going to be a high dimensional vector. They did a PCA to bring it down to two dimensions to show you so that you could visualize it. And look at how things cluster, right? So John admires Mary. Uh, John is in love with Mary. John respects Mary. These three are similar in sentiment. They sort of seem to cl cluster together. Mary admires John. Mary is in love with John. Mary respects John. These seem to cluster together. Now, if you change the subject or subject object order, I was given a card by her in the garden. In the garden, she gave me a card. She gave me a card in the garden. These cluster together. And she was given a card by me in the garden. In the garden, I gave her a card. I, I gave her a card in the garden. These cluster together. So these three are similar in, you know, in, in sentiment, in meaning. These three are similar in meaning. So they seem to cluster separately. And more interestingly, these three, the structural relationship between these three is the same 
as the structural relationship between these three, and that also seems to be reflected in these representations. So these hidden representations actually uh, end up capturing information, semantic and structural information about the input. And let's also look at some example outputs. Now, this is from machine translation. This is from English to French. I have zero French. So uh, uh, I can't even fake it, which means that uh, I can't tell you if this is good or bad, but I am told by people, does anybody in the class speak French? Anyone raise your hand if you speak French. Okay, Harry, can you tell me if these things are okay? Do they make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they grammatically make sense. They kind um, of make sense. Yeah. yeah. So I'm trusting him, right? Uh, but <laughs> I'm told they make sense. Here's a better one, which I can actually sort of uh, interpret myself with my own two eyes and sort of agree with. This is a, a dialogue system. So a human says something, that is the input, the machine responds. Now the machine, of course, leads the conversation. What is the error you're running, please? The human says, I'm seeing an error related to VPN. This was what the encoder saw. This is what the decoder produces. What is the error message that you're getting when connecting to VPN using Network Connect? And then the human response, connection refused or something like that. May I know the version of the Network Connect that you connect, network connect, you connect? I mean, it's kind of slightly broken, but you see that it's actually this, this is from this paper, a neural conversational model by Vinyals and Lay. You see that it's actually uh, producing very plausible outputs. This model really works. So we've got a great model, but this is, and we know it works, but it still has a problem, right? What is the problem here? So um, these were supposed to be hidden. Let me go. Yeah. Uh, the problem is this. It's not really optimal. The problem is that all the information about the input sequence is hidden, embedded into this one single vector over here, which is the hidden representation derived at the end of the input. So this one hidden value is overloaded with information and it's forced to carry all the information about the output, which is problematic, particularly if the input is a very long sequence. If you had like a 60 word sentence, you have this one tiny vector poor thing that's being forced to carry information about all 60 words in the input. Whereas in reality, every one of these hidden uh, states carry information about the input. What happens is that as you keep processing the input, as the information keeps getting forwarded, you know, they keep getting mushed together and the information sort of gets diluted in some sense. And so by the time you get here, uh, by the time you get here, uh, the, uh, the information is going to be sort of mixed up. But then if you look at the individual hidden states, they will actually bear a, uh, a, a more direct relation to what you want output. For example, you would expect the hidden state for I to have the maximum bearing on the word ish. You would expect the hidden state for the A word eight to have the maximum bearing on the production of Habe Gegessen. The hidden state for and should really sort of govern the production of Einen, the hidden state for Apple, bears the maximum relevance for Apfel. And this kind of structure gets lost when you simply mush everything together into this final vector. So yeah. are you guys getting this problem here? Raise your hands if you are. Is there any way this can be alleviated by having multiple hidden layers? You're still, Yes, right, but yes, just a little bit. I mean, you know, the number of hidden layers you have is still gonna be fixed and the input can be any arbitrary length, right? And so we are actually gonna solve this problem, right? 
And to show how to how we are going to solve this problem, I'm going to sort of separate the encoder and the decoder into two separate blocks just for visual visualization. Okay. But so here's what we had. We had the encoder which processed the input and produced some hidden representation. In our original model, this guy went in here, SOS went in here, you know, things kept kept getting fed back. I've sort of skipped that figure, those lines, and the decoder did, did its job. Uh, but now, uh, so we're going to uh, change things a little bit. The input is still going to be processed as usual by the encoder, but now instead of only passing this final hidden state to the decoder, what we will do is to compute a weighted sum of the hidden states at all times. And this weighted sum of the hidden states at all times is going to be passed separately to the decoder at each time. So this is the context. This is what we will call the context. That by producing each word, the decoder is going to see a weighted sum of the hidden states at all times in the encoder. So are you guys getting this? Raise your hands if you get this. Okay, so this seems to make sense. Does this solve our problem or do we have to change it? Do, do, do we have to, to make some additional modifications for this to solve our problem? Anyone? Does this solve our problem? Or what changes do we have to make for this to solve our problem? Somebody says something. Oh. We still need to know which word, like at the first timestamp, which word is more re relevant to a zero. So we still need, we are doing a weighted sum, but we need to know how to compute weight so that for ish, it automatically focuses on I. For Haba and Gagerson, it automatically focuses on H. So you want these weights to be varying with output time, right? And yeah. so at each output time, you want the weights to vary, which means that the uh, input to the hidden decoder layer is going to also vary with time. And specifically, these weights are going to be scalars, right? So, and the weights should somehow magically know which input to focus on. And if we manage to compute some weights that figured out which input to focus on, then you express, expect this to solve the problem that we had earlier where the final ve vector stored all of the uh, information, right? So here's what we are going to do. Now, in order to know what word to output at this time, right? There are two different things. So let's consider time two. In order to know what to output at time two, there are several things one must consider. One must consider the hidden state at time one. One must consider the output at time one. And then one, one must somehow figure out how to combine these guys. But to decide which of these hidden states to focus on, we have to derive the information from what is already present. And what do we already have? We already have the hidden state out here. So when you're trying to produce the output here, we already have the hidden state here. And so we are going to try to compute these weights by from the hidden state at the previous time and the encoder hidden states. So is this making sense to you guys? Raise your hands, yes or no? We'll wait for 40 hands to be raised. I'm still at 20 and 30, right? This is because there's nothing particularly challenging about this. This is very easy. Guys, less than a cloud, okay, thank you. So, so this makes sense, right? And the reason that at each time you're using the hidden state of the previous time is because that's all you have. But hopefully this carries all the necessary information. So you're going to use this hidden state and these guys and you're going to compute the weights. And the way you will do it is you're going to first make sure that the weights are a probability distribution over the input, that they sum to one. That way, uh, 
you can't have arbitrary weights. So you make them sum to one and then hopefully if you do things just right, the weight is sort of going to uh, be high for the near the words that are actually relevant and they're going to be low at the words that are not relevant. So when you're generating a fell, you would hope that the weights are going to be high in the region of apple and the input so that the weighted sum that goes in here is going to focus on the hidden state for the word apple. So, and this is because the weights are intended to highlight the important encoder state for that output. And so here's how we will do it. First, we want the weights to be a probability distribution. So we're going to decompose the weight into computation of the weight into two steps. First, we compute something like called a raw weight. The raw weight at any time is a function, the raw weight for each of the encoder steps at, for each decoder time. Now observe that there are two different times. There's an encoder time and there's a decoder time. The two are different, right? So at any decoder time, the raw weights for each of the encoder times is computed as a function of the hidden state at the previous decoder time and the hidden states at each of the encoder times. So I, do you guys get what this E is doing over here? Raise your hands. I haven't specified what G is, but you know, there's some function G which does this. I'll wait till 40 hands are raised, only 26. So I'll wait, we have some time today. Okay, and now once I compute the raw weights, I can use the raw weights, put them through a softmax, and I can, I can compute the normalized weights, which are a probability distribution over the input. And now I can use these weights to sum these hidden states and to provide that as context to the decoder. So what exactly is this function G? Several, several uh, functions have been suggested in the literature. So if this hidden state and these hidden states are the same size, then you can simply compute the inner product between the two for this raw hidden state. If they are different sizes, then you can do a matrix inner product where you compute this raw state as uh, H transpose WS. And this W is a matrix that can be learned to figure out how to uh, best match these two guys. And there have been other more complex functions, including possibly, you know, this guy itself could be an MLP that is being learned, right? So it doesn't matter. It's some, uh, some magical process that computes, you can come up with your own function and that's going to compute this raw weight. And from these raw weights, we can, we can put them to a softmax and compute the normalized weights. And, and then, so some of the edits in my slides haven't stuck. Uh, and now this is how we're going to perform process inference with this model. We first pass the input through the decoder and get a sequence of hidden encoder states. Then for the decoding, we initialize the decoder hidden state, either from the final hidden state here or a zero or some fixed value. It doesn't matter. It turns out that there are different ways of doing this. And then, uh, but this guy is important. How you actually uh, set it has got to be consistent. Uh, and then using this initial decoder hidden state, we will compute the raw weights for each of the encoder states and then use those to compute the, uh, the distribution over the encoder states. Then we compute the weighted sum of these encoder states using these weights. And this context and this hidden state and the startup sentence marker, all of them go into the hidden states, the, the, the uh, recurrent computation, state computation for the decoder, which produces a probability distribution from which you'll draw an output. Then say ish. Then at the next time, I'm going to take this state and all of these guys and compute the raw uh, weights and then put the raw weights through a softmax and get uh, the proper uh, distribution over these hidden states. Computed the weighted sum of these hidden states using these weights. And this guy and the previous word that was output 
and the hidden state are going, in, going to go in at the next time. And then you get the next distribution from which you might generate a word. Now this say next state and these guys are going to be used to compute the raw weights for the next time. And then from those you get the distribution over the hidden states. You compute the weighted sum and that goes in as context along with the previous word that was output and the hidden state. And you can continue this process till you generate the end of sentence marker. So is this process clear to everybody? Raise your hands if this is clear. I'll wait for 40 hands to be raised. Perfect. So this was easy, right? And again, as before, the business of uh, uh, drawing a word, the, this whole business of drawing the word is, is uh, uh, intended at producing the most probable sequence of output output words given the input sequence. So you want to do this whole process to generate the most likely sequence of output words. And again, as we saw in the earlier case today, you can't just be greedy, right? So everything that we saw earlier still holds. So as before, our solution is not to choose, but to retain all the choices which means after you, know, after you produce the first context and you, uh, you feed in the start of sentence marker, you're going to get a probability distribution over all of the words. You're going to clone your decoder, pass the hidden state to all clones, pass all of the words in, uh, and then now you get hidden states, but then here's the thing. Uh, uh, you're going to prune this guy, but here's the thing. Uh, when we uh, compute a context out here, this context for any at any time must be computed from the hidden state at the previous time, right? So which means that every path is likely going to have a different previous state. This one's previous state was here. This one's previous state was here. So you're going to have to go back and redo the weight computation and the context computation separately for every path in the state, in your, uh, in your beam. And so the context computation is gonna be repeated many, many times, once per live path. But besides that, this process is exactly the same as what we saw uh, earlier, which is you keep forking the network and, uh, and uh, extending the, uh, the uh, output and retaining the top K, you keep doing this till you terminate, till you end up with a termination where the most likely symbol is an end of sentence marker. So uh, uh, I sort of rushed through this, but we've already seen this in, in, in some, some detail before. So is this whole thing clear to everybody so far? Everything that we've covered so far? Any questions? I'll wait for a few seconds to, for questions and then continue. No questions? Anything on chat? Uh, Professor, yeah. can you give some intuition on why it's called attention models? Like yes, right here. Okay. So uh, look at this. What are these weights? Let's see what, when I'm generating each word, you compute got some weights and the weights are sort of, you're computing a weighted sum of these inputs of these hidden states to compute the context at this time, right? So what exactly do these weights look like? So let's to do that, let, let me plot it. And this is for the machine translation task. This is from Badana et al. Uh, here I've visually visual, visualized the weights, what I've done, is this is the uh, the input? This is this is the input sequence, and then this guy is the set of weights. Wait, no, no, this, and this is the output sequence. So this row over here is the set of weights that I was that I used to compute the context for the first output word. So this went in, 
we computed the raw weights and then normalized it. We got a bunch of weights. So this row out here is the set of weights that was used to produce the first word. Then after producing the first word, you use this hidden state, combine it with this guy, you produce the weights that you use to, produce, to compute the context for the second word. So the second row over here is the vector of weights for the second output word and so on, right? Observe how this, how the weights end up looking. This is, this is the uh, agreement on the uh, uh, European Economic Area was signed in August 1992, dot end of sentence marker, right? The first output word is le, and le translates to the in English. So the machine automatically learned to assign the maximum weight to the word the. It paid attention to the word the. Accord was agreement, right? So the weights automatically figured out that, it, that the network must pay the most attention to the word agreement. For so is on. It learned that it must pay the most attention to the word on. The most interesting portion is here. European economic area in French becomes zone economic European, which is the same words, but in reverse order, right? And the network automatically figured out that for zone, it must focus on this guy here, area. For economic, it must focus on the word econ economic. And for European, it must focus on the word European. So the attention automatically learned, the, these weights automatically learned what portion of the input to pay attention on. The general trend is diagonal, but local in these examples, but locally you can have all kinds of funky stuff. So did that answer your question? Why it's called attention? Yeah, but in the case that we use the G function is just like an inner product of the hidden states. Will that like learn separate weights for attention or will it learn the weights of the recurrent uh, structure itself? This weight has nothing to do with the recurrent structure. This weight is just for the attention, right? It's not learning it, it's computing it. If G is if 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 G has some parameters, so if you take this simple case, let me say this. I probably run a five few minutes over, but I, not very much. Okay, so let's say, uh, what? Where was my G? I can never find my. Okay, this guy, right? So here. When this G is being computed as an inner product between this state and this hidden state, does it have any parameters? No. So the G has nothing to learn. It's just that you expect that these hidden, that the encoder and the decoder will sort of be learned such that when you compute this inner product, it will automatically highlight the right words, right? If my G is of this structure, then the G has a parameter W, which can be learned. And in that case, you're kind of hoping that if you train the network properly, this W will be of the form such that when you compute this G, it's going to highlight the appropriate thing. And this weighting is just, you know, this weight is just basically a softmax computed over the raw weights. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, any other questions, guys? because that's not, that brings us to the last topic. So actually here are some more examples. This was, uh, uh, this, this is for again, machine translation. So Harry does, are these translations any good? Um, well, it's gonna take me a while to read, but um, it looks like it makes sense uh, with, you know, the caveat that idiomatic usage doesn't be in, uh, Okay, so I'll tell you what, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but what happened was that in November 2015, I think, uh, Google switched, or was it 2016, Google switched from using the previous statistical machine translation systems to using this particular model. And the Google Translate outputs, nowadays you can use Google Translate and Translate and you can be very comfortable with what it gives you. But only four years ago, the output you know, in early November would be complete rubbish. And suddenly it went to being completely useful. I mean, 
it may be slightly broken idiomatically, but it actually begins to make sense. So these things were like a quantum step forward in uh, machine translation and related tasks. So we've seen how we can uh, use a trained network to convert sequences to one, one sequence to another. But then let's look at training. And once again, the problem in training is computing the gradients. And so you have the same issue as before, right? Uh, if you don't actually pass the output along with the input, then the length of the output and input and target sequences can be very different. So the way we will train the network is that during inference for training, we will actually pass in the target output along with the input. We're gonna pass the target output to the decoder to generate these, uh, generate these uh, distributions. And then we can compute the divergence with respect to the, to the desired output. So at each time, the target word is going to be the next word in the sequence. And these divergences are going to be uh, propagated backwards. And in the process of prop back propagation, you're also going to update the parameters of the attention function. Gradient, gradient descent will update all of these parameters. So uh, there are some tricks of the trade. Uh, one of the issues is that ideally we should not be doing this, right? In principle, you should just be giving only the input and getting the output and learning the error and, and, and uh, uh, computing the divergence and training the network. So when you give this guy in, what you're really doing is giving the decoder a whole lot of guidance in what it must do next when you're training the network. So you're basically, we call this teacher forcing in that the teacher, which is you is you, is basically giving it all of this guidance when it's generating this output. And ideally, you don't want to give this much guidance. So what can, can anybody suggest how I can give it slightly less guidance? Anyone? Any one suggestion, guys? None. So here's what I can do. Every now and then, instead of actually giving it the true word, I can just randomly draw a word from here. Not the entire sequence, but every, every uh, word here and there for some fraction of the input, instead of giving it the ground truth here, I will actually give it a draw a word from here, which is halfway between what we must be ideally doing and what we would do if you're guiding the training completely. And so that is, uh, uh, that is what we will call uh, teacher. This is teacher forcing, and this is the regular training. And uh, the fraction of words that you will choose to draw in this manner to feed to the input is yet another hyperparameter that you will be uh, poking around with in your homeworks. So uh, there have been various other uh, tricks of the trade. I won't actually go through this. One of the issues with drawing a sample and putting it in here is that the process of drawing a sample is a non-differentiable step. So we want to, because you're doing a random sample. So there's something called a gumball noise trick, which converts this non-differentiable sampling uh, into uh, doing a max over the, so you, you uh, generate some parameters, add it to this probability distribution and then do a max. The max can be converted to a soft max and then the whole thing becomes differentiable. So there's some other tricks of the trade. You will encounter this when you're doing your homework. So make sure, and also, I think this has been clarified in the recitation. So make sure to go over that. Uh, there are some various other extensions. The input encoded can be bidirectional. Uh, you have variations on the, on the uh, attention itself. You can have local attention, which looks at local regions of the input versus global attention, which looks at the entire input uh, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, there's some other ex extensions. Anyway, so uh, there are lots of very impressive results with attention-based models. Right now, attention-based models are the state of the art in pretty much anything, including lately image analysis. So they are currently responsible for the state of the art in all kinds of sequence conversion systems like machine translation, speech recognition, dialogue systems. Uh, they are part of GPT-2 and all of these fancy uh, 
uh, text models that you, the, the text processing models that you were, you've probably been working with. And in the latest research, they've actually shown that you can just use attention models to analyze images and uh, it works great too, right? So uh, here are some more just closing. Uh, here is an example for attention models and uh, image captioning uh, from Zhu et al. in 2016, where they applied attention to image to derive captions from images. Here, the decoder used attention to decide which pixels of the image it must focus on to generate every individual word. And so look at this. This is for this image, the caption it generated is a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. But then when you look at what it paid attention to when it generated the word frisbee, it's actually focusing on the frisbee. A dog is standing on a hardwood floor and well, the dog isn't standing. But if you look at what it focused on when it saw the, when it was producing dog, it actually catches the dog. How do they do these um, visualizations? Is this based on the weight matrix? This is the weight matrix. Right. But isn't there like a, don't we have more weights than we have pixels? No, you're going to have just so, remember, so here uh, their encoder is a CNN. The CNN is going to have one output for every pixel, maybe down sample, but more or less, right? So the CNN output is going to be a map of the input, right? And so the encoder, actually the decoder sees a weighted sum of the output of the final layer of the CNN. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Right, and so you can just visualize it. I mean, does it, it's pretty amazing. The whole thing, these models are really, really good. Uh, anyway, so closing the entire series on recurrent networks, just six minutes over time. Uh, we've looked at various forms of sequence to sequence models, which are generalizations of recurrent neural network formalisms. Uh, there's been a lot of work in the entire area, so we should be looking at Please uh, take a look at some of the more recent papers. You should be in a position to understand them. Uh, and of course, uh, post on Piazza if you have questions. We'll try to post some links to some of the re recent papers. And it appears in homework four. You're going to be doing speech recognition with attention models. And so that's the end of this series. Uh, we'll stop recording. So, TS, can you stop the recording, please? Yes.